You want to present yourself to the world in a manner that doesn't disgrace you in some sense. That, that might be a good way to think about it. You don't want to disgrace yourself because the consequence of disgrace is emotional dysregulation. More pain, less positive emotion. And so the best way to present yourself is to stand up forthrightly and to stretch out, you know, and to occupy some space. And to you make yourself sort of vulnerable by doing that because you open up the front of your body, right? But it's a sign of confidence. And that way people are most likely to give you the benefit of the doubt. And that's a good way to start regulating your mood. But not only does it directly regulate your mood to stand up because it's so tightly associated, like posture flexion is associated with serotonin and emotional regulation, but also because if you straighten up and you present yourself in that manner, then other people are more likely to take you seriously. And that means they'll start treating you as if you're a number one lobster instead of a number 10 lobster. And that's another way that you can at least give yourself the bloody benefit of the doubt and confront the world in a courageous manner. Standing up has changed my life. Not just standing up for myself and standing up for what I might believe in and the the standing up, what is it? It's not metaphysical, the, 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 the theoretical, I don't know. But, but actually standing up, like the physical standing up. Going from sitting down, <laughs> like I am right now in my car, but to standing up has changed my life. Stand up desks are now a huge uh, trend and a huge boost and, and I would definitely recommend checking some of those out. But when I first started standing up was probably, wow, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I just found that when I was on the phone and talking, see, this is how it started. So I've been on, I'm actually now on a, my office is a trampoline. So I'm on a stand up trampoline desk. I had to raise my desk uh, 10 inches so that the trampoline could be underneath it. And I get 20 to 40,000 jumps a day on my trampoline. I went through three trampolines last year because they broke because most are not designed to be jumped on that often. But trampolining while working might be a, a stretch for most people right now. If you ever see me and I'm doing an interview and I'm on my main computer, you might see me doing little micro bounces and I'm trying to control it, <laughs> like holding onto the desk, like don't bounce, don't bounce, don't bounce, because it can be it can be annoying to watch on an interview, but for the most part, I'm bouncing up and down all day long on my trampoline. Now, why? Why did I start this? Well, 15, 20 years ago, I just found that when I was on the phone and I was, I was talking to clients, I would be better when I was walking around. I don't know if it's a nervous energy or what, but when I sat down, it was less energetic, less, less like, let's go do this thing. And when I, when I stood up, it was just, I had more energy. You could test for yourself. Do you have more energy when you're standing up or when you're sitting down? And so on calls, I would I would not just stand up, but I would walk around. I like to have something going on. I often, people comment on some of my videos where I fidget with my ring. So my ring, whenever I'm thinking, I like to be, I don't like to be meditative and still. I like to have something going on. So I'm often, I'm often fidgeting with my ring or you might see my ears move up and down every now and then when I'm thinking. Um, I like walking around, just having something going. It, it helps me think and process better. And so that was the starting point was just, okay, cordless phone and walk around. Then I discovered a stand-up desk. I forget who it was. It might have been Tim Ferriss. Again, way back in the day. And the, the test was not a full-on stand-up desk because those barely existed. But I took my bookcase and I cleared off the book, all the books in the bookcase, and I found the shelf that was the kind of the best height to put my laptop on, and I just tried standing there. And I think this is a good life hack, not just for standing up or not, but just in general, if you want to try something, don't go off and buy the most expensive thing and wait three weeks for it to be delivered. Just go try something right now. So if you want to try stand-up desks, don't go buy a stand-up desk. Don't do that. That's the worst thing you can do. Don't spend a ton of money on a stand-up desk and then wait three weeks for it to be delivered to you. Just take a bookcase or take some boxes and put it at the right height and see how it feels. You want to start a YouTube channel. Perfect. Don't, don't go researching and spend weeks buying the gear and the lights and the cameras and all that stuff. And it, most of that, most of the stuff in these little experiments end up failing and they now you bought all this gear that's just sitting in your garage you know your closet or your mom's basement the best thing to do is just start find a small way to just get started and so i stood up at my bookcase 
And the first day, I didn't last very long, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, I, I, it didn't last very long. When you're not used to standing up, it <laughs> it's really hard. It's like, oh, where, I need to sit down. And after that first 20 or 40 minutes, I got tired and I had to sit down because my body wasn't used to it. But while I was standing up, I was like, I really like this. This is cool. I have more energy in just answering emails and whatever else I was doing at the time. I had more energy, so I'm going to try it again. And that 20 minutes became 30 minutes, became 40, became two hours, became four hours, became six hours to the point where I was like, I, I could just stand up all day long. It became weird when people came over to my office because there were no chairs to sit down at. So when we're doing a meeting, I'm standing up. And so they were standing up because there were no chairs and it felt awkward to have one person standing, one person sitting. And then they start getting tired because <laughs> after 20 minutes of standing up, they got tired. So I had to I had to bring chairs back to my office to host meetings. And um, but that was the process. That was the starting point. And it it turned out to have all sorts of positive health benefits and um, I had I had uh, foot issues I had uh, the things that you put in your in your shoes what they called not implants uh, customized soles whatever I was going to a car like in my 20s I was going to a chiropractor almost every week because my back was was a mess my knees were were uh, achy and cracking every time I was walking like my body seemed to be falling apart in my 20s I'm now 40 two in may i'm 42 and uh, my body is in better condition than i was in my 20s because a, a big i think a big factor is because i'm on a trampoline all day long instead of sitting all day long with terrible posture and my body falling apart now i'm jumping on a trampoline all day long it's easy on my joints my body i'm happy i have more energy and as a result i'm healthier uh, the move to a trampoline came because i was I was already standing up for at least five years, uh, maybe more. And I saw Tony Robbins do uh, his his seminars and uh, backstage, he would always jump before he goes on stage. Tony jumps a couple times on his rebounder. Rebounder is just a mini trampoline, not like the giant trampolines, like what you have in your backyard. A rebounder is a mini version of it that you can keep in your office or your home or whatever. He jumps a couple times on his rebounder. Uh, sprays something in his mouth, uh, does like a spin, and then walks on stage. <laughs> if you ever see him backstage, that's what he's always doing. He jumps on his trampoline a couple times, puts something in his mouth, spins around, goes out on stage, ready to go. Uh, and so that's pretty cool. I wonder what he's spraying in his mouth. Uh, and I like the whole trampoline thing. If I'm already standing up, why not get a trampoline and try? And so again, What's, what's the easiest way to go off and do it? Well, I, I went to my local Walmart and I bought a rebounder and brought it home and had to adjust the height of my desk and had to raise it beyond what the max height was. And the rebounder I bought ended up breaking shortly after because it wasn't designed to be jumped on that often, all day long, every day, right? Uh, but whatever, it's fine. Lessons learned, right? You figure it out and you think, do, is this worth doing or not? Take the idea that you've got and try, because again, the biggest thing that most people are missing is just momentum. You're just not trying. You have this, you've got this idea and we spend our best energy planning and, and ideating and researching and what's the perfect trampoline and what's the perfect stand-up desk. And you spend all that energy researching and then tomorrow you wake up, but the next week you come back or the next month or whatever, and like nothing has happened on it still. You have all these great intentions, but there's not enough momentum. And so idea to action, trust that your ideas come to you for a reason and go do something about them. And so go get the stand up desk by creating boxes in your office. You know, go get the cheapest uh, trampoline at Walmart and just jump on it and see how it feels. It's ended up changing my life. So I'm not used to sitting down anymore. Uh, we actually moved, we just sold our place, we bought a new place and I moved uh, into one of the rooms as a temporary place while we were showing our place because my office backdrop doesn't is not very conducive to selling the house most people are not used to a stand-up desk a giant stand-up desk and trampoline and all that and so i i took my office down because when you're selling a home you want it to appeal to everybody and i sat down for i don't know a couple weeks while we were selling our place and all of a sudden, the back issues came back. 
Uh, I was cracking my back a lot. My knees started to hurt again. My feet started to hurt again. My posture was terrible <laughs> again. And I realized, wow, this is why I stand up. So two lessons in this video. The first is try standing up. You know, you'll probably have more energy. You'll probably feel better. It's probably better for your health. People say sitting is the new smoking, right? So try standing up and just give it a shot. And don't stress out if you get tired after 20 minutes like I did the first time through. It's okay. But do you have more energy while you're working while you're standing up? And if so, then just keep going and just start with a bookshelf or some bookshelf uh, or some boxes, whatever, just to get started. And the second lesson is, is just do something, just momentum, imperfect action. The ideas that you have in your head are great. They're genius. You need to do something. You're, you need to stop putting the gas pedal on the energy that's flowing through you. Like greatness is flowing through you and you're actively saying, stop, 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 do something. Find the smallest possible way today, today, to, like right now, the smallest possible way to take that awesome idea in your head and build some momentum towards it. Because the only thing you're missing towards your great life is the momentum. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. It is my firm belief that each of us have a responsibility to set the world right in the manner that we are able to and that that is a fundamental that's a fundamental import. I really believe in some sense it's of cosmic import in the same way that consciousness itself is of cosmic import. And consciousness reflects being itself. You write in the book, there is no faith and no courage and no sacrifice in doing what is expedient. What do you say to those viewers that don't pursue their dreams and are locked in their careers because they are too afraid to take risks and pursue something mm. meaningful. Well, the first thing I would say is, well, you should be afraid of taking risks and pursuing something meaningful. But you should be more afraid of staying where you are if it's making you miserable. It's like the first thing you want to do is dispense with the idea that you get to have any, any permanent security outside of your ability to contend and adapt. It's the same issue with children. It's like you're paying a price by sitting there being miserable. And you might say, well, the devil I know is better than the one I don't. It's like, don't be so sure of that. The clock is ticking. Yeah, but and if you're miserable in your job now and you change nothing, in five years, you'll be much more miserable and you'll be a lot older. But and isn't so it a luxury to pursue what is meaningful? Our viewers have mortgages, they have children, yeah. they have payments and loans. It's well, a luxury to pursue because we, we lack the resources. Well, I don't think, I don't remember now, I'm not talking about what makes you happy. It's a luxury to pursue what makes you happy. It's a moral obligation to pursue what you find meaningful. And that doesn't mean it's easy. It might require sacrifice. If you need to change your job too, let's say you have a family and, 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 and children and, and a mortgage, you have responsibilities. You've already picked up those responsibilities. You don't just get to walk away scot-free and say, well, I don't like my job, I quit. That's no strategy. But what you might have to do is you think, well, this job is killing my soul. All right, so what do I have to do about that? Well, I have to look for another job. Well, no one wants to hire me. It's like, okay, maybe you need to educate yourself more. Maybe you need to update your, your curriculum vitae, your resume. Maybe you need to overcome your fear of being interviewed. Maybe you need to sharpen your social skills. Like, you, you have to think about these things strategically. If you're going to switch careers, you have to do it like an intelligent, responsible person. That might take you a couple of years of, of, of effort. I've dealt with hundreds of people in my clinical and consulting practice, and we set a goal, we develop a vision, and work towards it, and it, it, things inevitably get better for people. So it's not a luxury, it's, it's difficult. It's a moral responsibility and it isn't happiness. It's, it's not, the pursuit isn't for happiness. Well, that isn't how it is. It's like we're built for struggle, us human beings. 
you're, you're not after um, the bubbles of bliss that Dostoevsky described in, in Notes from Underground. We're built to contend with the world. We're built to contend with reality. You want a challenge. And the best way that you can take on a challenge, because a challenge fortifies you. So you don't want to be secure, you want to be strong. And you get strong by taking on optimal challenges. And so you lay out your destiny in the world and you take the slings and arrows of fate. And you make yourself stronger while you're doing so. And you might fail and fortune might do you in. But it's your best bet. And, you know, people have also, people have, had, have extracted unbelievable successes out of catastrophic failures. And so, and I'm not saying that in a naive way. I know perfectly well what happens to people, you know. You're doing fine in life and then you get cancer. And then six months later, you're dead. And all the heroism in the world isn't going to save you at that point. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Life is bounded by mortality. But that doesn't mean that you don't get out there and contend. And you develop by contending and you minimize the net amount of suffering in the world. And that's something, man. That's something to do. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. Yeah, because if you're comparing yourself to someone else, I mean, first of all, you don't know very much about the life of the person you're comparing yourself to. You don't know it, you know it across all of its dimensions. And second, people are very different. And so comparing yourself to someone else, it's, it's kind of useful, I guess, when you're young. But as you get older and more singular and more particular, it becomes increasingly less useful. Better to compare yourself to a previous version of yourself and work for improvement in that way. Life is difficult and you cannot protect your children. What you can do is prepare them and you can prepare them to be strong and courageous and truthful and resilient and reciprocal in their interactions with other people. And that means you equip them for what life will be, which is a at minimum, a series of difficult challenges, and, and often more than that, because, of course, people go through very difficult times in their lives, and a, a resilient person is capable of standing up to things in the face of fear and moving forward voluntarily, convinced of their own competence and ability to prevail. And so the primary, your primary goal as a parent, apart from facilitating your child's social desirability, which is a major obligation on your part is to encourage your children and to, and I mean that literally, to instill in them a sense of courage in the face of the difficulties of life and not to protect them from that. We don't even want to be protected from those difficulties because a major part of life and its meaning is the, the challenge that comes with confronting difficulties. I said with Bill C-16 that I wouldn't speak the language of the radical leftists because I don't think that that language should define the game. But let's say it does. So here's the game. The world is a battleground of groups and the, they're battling for power. That's it. That's the game. And some of them win and they oppress those who don't win. So that's how we're going to view the world. Okay, now the leftists say, okay, well, here's the oppressed people. The oppressors the patriarchy type, patriarchal types, they should be ashamed of themselves and give up some power. And the right-wingers, the radical right-wingers look at that and they say, oh, I see, so the game is ethnic identity, is it? It's, it's identity politics. Okay, we're white males. We're not gonna lose. That's the right-wing version of identity politics. It's like, screw you. If we're gonna divide into groups, if we're gonna divide into tribes, and I'm in my tribe, I'm not gonna get all guilty and lose. I'm going to get all cruel and win. And that's like, then you think, well, there's people in the middle. They're kind of looking back and forth. Which side of the identity politics spectrum am I going to fall in? Do I want to go with the, uh, do I want to go, do I want to be driven primarily by compassion? And I'm, am I going to accept guilt for my historical privilege? So that's one possibility. And then I'm the oppressor. I'm the member of the oppressor group. Or am I going to say, oh, no, to hell with that. I'm just going to play to win. Well, then I'm going to go to the right. It's like, well, my sense is, how about we don't play either of those games? And the reason we shouldn't play them is, well, the Soviets played the left-wing game and like killed who knows how many tens of millions of people. You can't even count it accurately. The estimates range from 20 to 100 million. Those are pretty big error bars. And the, and the Maoists, maybe 100 million, certainly 60 million. So, okay, that didn't work out so well. And then there's the Nazis, like they played ethnic identity politics and racial superiority. It's like, what do we, we want to play that game? See, what I've been trying to do, really, what I've been trying to do for the last 30 years is say, look, 
There's heavy temptations to play those sorts of games. But that's not the only game in town. It's a much better game to play individual. It's like, get your act together. Stand up in the world. Make something of yourself. Stay away from the ideological oversimplifications. Set your house in order. That's rule six in, the, in, the, in this book. So I have a book rule in there that says, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. And it's a very dark chapter about the motivations of the Columbine High School killers and this other guy named Carl Panzram, who was a serial rapist and arsonist and murderer. And these, he wrote an autobiography and the Columbine kids also wrote about why they did what they did. They're resentful to the core, bitter, bitter, resentful, terrible. And well, I'm suggesting that people stay away from that resentment, resentfulness and bitterness, even though life is hard and, it, and, it, and there's malevolence in the world. It's like, yeah, you can, you can tell a story where everyone's a victim because we all die. We all get sick, you know, and, and, and things happen to us that are bitter and terrible, betrayal, deceit, lies, like people hurt us on purpose, you know, so it's not just the tragedy of life. It's malevolence as well. It's everyone's a victim. You can tell that story. The problem is if you tell that story and you start to act it out, you make all of that worse. That's the problem. And it's so this is why partly I got attracted to Christian imagery, at least in part, because um, there's an idea in Christianity that you should pick up your God cross and like walk up the hill. And that's dramatically, that's correct. That's the right answer. It's like you've got a heavy load of suffering to bear and a fair bit of it's going to be unjust. So what are you going to do about it? Accept it voluntarily and try to transform as a consequence. That's the right answer. It's the right answer because the rest of it is tribalism. And we're, we're too technologically powerful. The baboon here who's supposed to be basically just a fool when the story was first written, he turned into what's essentially a shaman across time. And the, so he represents the self from the Jungian perspective. Now the self is everything you could be across time. So you imagine that there's you and there's the potential inside you, whatever that is, you know. And potential is an interesting idea because it represents something that isn't yet real, yet we act like it's real. Because people will say to you, you should live up to your potential. And that potential is partly what you could be if you interacted with the world in a manner that would gain you the most information, right? Because you build yourself out of the information in the Piagetian sense. But it's deeper than that too, because we know that if you take yourself and you put yourself in a new environment, new genes turn on in your nervous system. They encode for new proteins. And so you're full of biological potential that won't be realized unless you move yourself around in the world into different challenging circumstances and that'll turn on different circuits. So it's not merely that you're incorporating information from the outside world in the constructivist sense. It's that by exposing yourself to different environments, you put different physiological demands on, on yourself all the way down to the genetic level and that manifests new elements of you. And so one of the things that happens to people, and this is a very common cultural notion, is that you should go on a pilgrimage at some point to somewhere central and that would be say like the rock in the Pride Rock in the Lion King, because you take yourself out of your dopey little village and that's just the little bounded you that everyone knows and that isn't very expanded. And then you go somewhere dark and dangerous to the central place and while you do that, you have adventures and they toughen you and pull more out of you. Dual familial and social harmony. That's what I want. People say that to me and you know, I, I don't think it's exactly right. There's a, there's a line in the Old Testament, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I think it's more like that. It's not that I'm courageous, it's that I'm afraid of the right things. So when I made my videos, it wasn't like that didn't make me nervous. But I was less nervous about going back to bed and not saying what I had to say than I was about making the videos. Because I know where this is going. I don't want to go there. And so it's, it's not so much courage, it's that it's a matter of, I, it's, it's, it's less risky to say something than to remain silent when you know there's something to be said. I know that to be the case. And so lots of times in life, it's like, there's no pathway forward that's going to shield you from risk. You get to pick this risk, or you get to pick this risk. And I think I picked the lesser risk. And that might be wise, but I'm not so sure it's courageous. You don't tell your kid, here's an impossible thing, why don't you go out and fail? You say, here's something worth going after, Here's a step you could take that would push you beyond where you are, 
but that you also have a reasonably high probability of succeeding at. Mm -hmm. Right? They call that within the, a time frame. Mm, yeah, within yeah. some time frame. That's the other thing. You have to parameterize it with regards to time frame. That's right. And that puts you in the zone of proximal development. And that's a that's a concept that was generated by a guy named Vygotsky. He was a Russian developmental psychologist and a smart one. It's where the idea of the zone comes from, mm, to be in the zone. Yes. And when you're in the zone, you're expanding your skills at, in a manner that's intrinsically rewarding because you're succeeding. And so you wanna set, if you're good to yourself, you think, okay, I need to set a goal, but I need to set a goal that someone as stupid and useless as me could probably attain if they put some effort into it. Right. And then, you got, then you've got it perfectly because it's not so high that it's grandiose or impossible that you fail necessarily and then justify your bitterness. It's like, well, I could do, well, because that, that happens to people. Happens man. all the time. Yeah, it's like. See this all the time. You know, it's like, it's, yes, exactly. Well, I set a goal and I didn't attain it, so I'm not gonna set any more goals. Right. It's like, no, you set a goal that was inappropriate. For the you, time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right, you didn't calibrate it properly. Yeah. And, and you're playing a trick on yourself because you wanted to fail so that you could justify not having to try. Well. And being a victim, mm -hmm. yeah. Which isn't in helpful, you're still gonna be a victim. <laughs> it's yeah. like, there's no way out of that, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, because life is, this, life is a challenge that in some sense can't be surmounted. So there's no way out of your problem. Not only do you have to move from point A to B in life, but point A is often a very difficult place to be because we're fragile and bounded and mortal and limited and because we know that. And so one of the implications of that, as many great religious traditions are at pains to illustrate or demonstrate or proclaim, is that life is essentially suffering. And I believe that to be a fundamental truth. But but perhaps not the most fundamental truth, because I think the most fundamental truth is that despite the fact that life is suffering, people can transcend that. And partly the way they transcend that is by pursuing things of value. And so that if there is no value proposition at hand, then you have no meaning to justify the difficult conditions of your life. And that's brutally difficult for people. You know, Nietzsche said, um, he who has a why can bear any how. And you see, and, and I've certainly seen this as a clinical practitioner, that people who have no purpose in their life are embittered by the difficulties of their life. And they become first bitter, and then resentful, and then revengeful, and then cruel. And there's plenty of places to go past cruel. That's just where you start if you're really on a downhill path. The more radical the necessary change, the more pain that accompanies it. Like the more opportunity as well. But, and a lot of what we learn, we learn painfully. And so it's not surprising that people shrink away from learning. We learn in pain and anxiety very frequently. Everyone knows that. It's like the things that really, that you really learned in life. It's like, it was no joy, man. Like it took you out. And so the fact that people flee from that is hardly surprising. But it doesn't help. That's the thing. It just <laughs> stores up the catastrophe for later. And so the better, the better idea is to eat a little poison every day so that you don't have to overdose in a month. It's something like that. And it is the case that I think because you don't, you aren't forced to, first of all, you don't learn unless you're forced to learn. I know there's alternatives to that. There's the voluntary search for knowledge. And, and that's a fine thing. And that is an antidote to this. But apart from that, speaking more practically, you tend not to learn unless you're forced to learn. And, it's, and what you tend to learn by force are difficult lessons. And so people are very prone to not, to not seek that out. It's not surprising. But it's because they don't understand the consequences very well. You know, you, you, it's because maybe it's because they're convinced that there's some way of forestalling the necessary learning. And there isn't any way of forestalling it. All you do is make it worse in the future. You make yourself smaller and you make the lesson harder. And so that's why in so many religious doctrines, there's emphasis on humility. You know, and humility isn't to debase yourself. It's to understand that you don't know enough so that your life isn't going to be miserable. And so every chance you get to grab something new that will help you along your way, you should take it as fast as you can. But you have to have a very tragic, I would say, view of reality, and also a harsh one, because it's not just tragedy, it's also malevolence. You have to understand that those are waiting for you, and that makes you desperate enough to learn. 
And that might be make you desperate enough to fall out of your ideology. But that's, that's a hard way of looking at the world. It beats living through it though. One of the things I've yeah. been talking to my audiences about is the relationship between responsibility and meaning, which mm -hmm. is, the, uh, uh, what would you say, it's a, it's a constant refrain in the book. It's mm -hmm. one of its underlying um, um, messages, let's say, or themes is a better way of thinking about it. Um, you know, if you start with the presumption that there's a baseline of suffering in life and that that can be uh, exaggerated by, as a consequence of human failing, as a consequence of malevolence and betrayal and self-betrayal and deceit and all those things that we do to each other and ourselves that we know that aren't good, that amplifies the suffering. That's sort of the baseline against which you have to work. And, and, and it's contemplation of that often that makes people hopeless and depressed and anxious and overwhelmed and yeah. all of that, and, and, and they have the reasons. But you need something to put up against that. And what you put up against that is meaning. Meaning is actually the instinct that helps you guide yourself through that catastrophe. And most of that meaning is to be found in the adoption of responsibility. So if you think, for example, if you think about the people that you admire, well, yeah. you think about when you have a clear conscience first, because yeah. that's a good thing to aim at, which is something different than happiness, right? Um, a clear conscience is different than happiness. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. That's you're not better. Like guilting yourself, you're not feeling bad about yourself. That's right. You feel yeah. that you've justified Clean. you've justified your existence, yeah. right? And so you're not waking up at three in the morning in a cold sweat thinking about all the terrible things that you've involved yourself in. Mm. What you, you know, said to someone that you shouldn't have said, mm -hmm. or how you acted, or mm -hmm. lied. What or opportunity deceit. you lost or or, mm -hmm. or or yeah, or or the things that you've that you've let go that you should have capitalized on mm -hmm. and all of that. And so if you think about the times when you're at peace with yourself with regards to how you're conducting yourself in the world, it's almost always conditions under which you've adopted responsibility, mm. right? At least the most, the most guilt I think that you can experience perhaps is the sure knowledge that you're not even taking care of yourself so that you're leaving that responsibility to other people because that's pretty pathetic and I, unless you're psychopathic. And you know, and, and you're living a parasitical life, and, mm. and that that characterizes a very small minority of people, and an even smaller minority think that's justifiable. But most of the time, you're in guilt and shame because you're not, you're you're not. Not only are you not taking care of yourself, let's say, so someone else has to, but you're not living up to your full potential, and so there's an existential weight that goes along with that. You know, we kind of have this idea that, while well, you're free as a child, and then you. Let me see if I can if I can put this properly. That you have a certain delightful, wonderful, positive freedom as a child, and then that's given up as you approach adulthood. But the truth of the matter is, is that you have a lot of potential as a child, but none of that is capable of manifesting itself as freedom before you become disciplined. And discipline is a matter of the imposition of order, and the order is necessary, especially for people who are hopeless and nihilistic. And lots of people are hopeless and nihilistic way more people than you think. And part of that is because no one's ever really encouraged them. And so the book is in part a matter of encouragement. It's like, lay yourself, lay a disciplinary structure on yourself, get the chaos in, in, in check, and then you can move towards a state that's freer, because it's discipline first. Like, look, if you're gonna become a concert pianist, there's gonna be several thousand hours of extraordinarily disciplined practice. That's the imposition of order on your potential, let's say. But what comes out of that is a much grander freedom. Your best bet is truth. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's always gonna do the trick, right? I mean, sometimes you go fight a dragon and it eats you. And if, the, if you being eaten wasn't a real possibility, it wouldn't be a real fight. And so you see people, like I've seen people in my clinical practice sometimes. I had one client in particular who was undergoing a particularly vicious divorce with someone who was really seriously inclined to take him out and would do pretty much everything at her disposal to do so. And I strategized with him for about three years and we did everything, like, and hyper carefully. He was a very conscientious and diligent person and he put into practice everything that we discussed and strategized and he still pretty much, he got backed into a corner so hard that I didn't know how to help him anymore. So I would say, however, that he, like, he was a very truthful person throughout that and one thing he did do was 
part of it was a custody battle. And he did manage, despite his decline, in consequence of being repeatedly cornered, I would say, he did manage to establish what I think was a lasting relationship with his kids. So he might have got enough out of what he did to justify it, even though the whole landscape was pretty awful. I think that not lying is your best bet, but life is hard and people get run over. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to emerge in any obvious sense triumphant. But if you take the alternative path, path especially when you're facing severe tribulations, let's say, and you complicate those with deceit, you can be sure that whatever tragedy that you're confronting is going to turn into not only tragedy, but something very much akin to hell. And so you might be able to at least minimize the degree of suffering, even if you can't overcome it or transcend it. Well, before the political stuff blew up, I had a million views on YouTube, which is not nothing. A million of anything is a lot. But then when the political scandal started to break, yeah, yeah then people came <clears throat> for them, but stayed for the content. And so, and that's been really love. useful. Yeah. yeah, well, it's been, love. well, and it's not that surprising. Well, you know, because of yeah. what you do, it's like peop, there's a great hunger for information that is practical and useful and that helps people find meaning in their lives and orient themselves. There's a great hunger for that. And most of my lectures were derived from solid psychology, some of it experimental, some of it biological, some of it from, from, from the domains of neuroscience, a lot of it from great clinicians. It's not surprising that people find it helpful because, yeah. well, great <laughs> clinicians were great because they were really helpful. And so to distill that and to offer it to people in a digestible form, to have that have a good effect on them, well, that's, that's what you'd expect. That's what the whole discipline is about. And so that's been, that's been great. This circumambulation that Jung talked about was this continual, we'll return to this, this continual circling in some sense of who you could be. You might notice, for example, that there are themes in your life. You know, when you go back across your experiences, you see you kind of have your typical experience that sort of repeats itself. And there might be variation on it, like a musical theme, but it's, it's like, you're, you're circling yourself and getting closer to yourself as you move across time. That's the circumambulation. Now, you remember that for a sec, because we'll go back to it. Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea, because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so, the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure that you're going to get it right the first time is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea, and which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until it's waiting for Godot, until they finally got it right. But the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help. Because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. So, so you have, there's, Nietzsche, Nietzsche called that a will, will to stupidity, which I really liked. So, because he thought of stupidity as being, it, you know, it's, it's, you have to take it into account fundamentally, and work with it. And so, and so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny, and you can assume that you're going to do it badly. And that's really useful, because you don't have to beat yourself up. It's pretty easy to do it badly. But the thing is, it's way better to do it badly than not to do it at all. You start your path, and you think that you're heading you know, towards your star. And so you go in that direction. And then, because you're here, the world looks a particular way, but then when you move here, the world looks different, and you're different as a consequence of having made that voyage. And so what that means is that now that thing that glimmers in front of you is going to have shifted its location, because you weren't very good at specifying it to begin with, and now that you're a little sharper and more focused than you were, it's, it's going to reveal itself with more accuracy to you. And so then you have to take a 
you know, it's almost like 180 degree reversal. But it isn't because, you know, you've, I mean, you've gone this far and that's a long ways to get that far. But that's a lot farther than you would be if you just stayed where you were waiting. And so it doesn't matter that you overshoot continually. Because as you overshoot, even if you don't learn what you should have done, you're going to continually learn what you shouldn't keep doing. And if you learn enough about what you shouldn't keep doing, then that's tantamount at some point to learning at the same time what you should be doing. So it's okay. So it's like this. Now, what's cool about it though, I think, is that as you progress, the degree of overshooting starts to decline, right? And that we know that there's nothing hypothetical about that. As you learn a new skill, like even to play, play a song on the piano, for example, you overshoot madly. You're making all sorts of mistakes to begin with, and then the mistakes They, they disappear. The fact that you're full of faults doesn't mean you have to stop. And thank God for that. That's a really useful thing. And the fact that you're full of faults doesn't mean that you can't learn. And so you can posit an ideal and you're going to be wrong about it, but it doesn't matter because what you're right about is positing the ideal and moving towards it. If the actual ideal isn't conceptualize perfectly. Well, first, surprise, surprise, because like, what are you going to do that's perfect? So it doesn't matter that it's imperf imperfect. It just matters that you do it and that you move forward. So that's really, that's really positive news as far as I'm concerned, because you can actually do that, right? You can do it badly. Anyone can do that. So that's, that's useful. I'm incredibly that's nervous to uh, talk in front of you because you've got to be one of the most formidable people that I've ever heard of or ever listened to or ever seen. So my question is, again, you're one of the best communicators that I've ever listened to. If I could be half as good at you, or at communicating as you are, I would be set. How can I teach myself to do that? Practice. You know, really, like, well, there's a couple of things. Is it helps to read a lot. It really helps to write. So if you want to make yourself articulate, which is a very good idea, then not only should you read, but you should write down what you think. And if you can do that a little bit every day, 15 minutes, maybe you could steal 15 minutes and do it every day. But if you do that for 10 years, you really straighten out your thinking. If you're going to speak effectively, you have to know way more than you're talking about, you know, so if you, this is often difficult for beginning lecturers at university because they'll do a lecture on a topic, but they only know as much as they're saying in the lecture. And they get kind of stuck to their notes because of it. But you want to know 10 times as much as you are saying in the lecture, and then you can specify a stepping path through it and elaborate with the other things that you know. But to do that, you have to do a lot of reading. But you also have to do a lot of reading because that's where the synthesize, that's where the synthesizing comes. So that's on the input side. And then on the output side, well, there's some tricks, techniques, let's say, is like if you're speaking in front of a group, you are not delivering a talk to a group. That's not what you're doing. The talk isn't a packaged thing that you present to a group. There isn't a group. There's a bunch of individuals and you talk to them. So when I talk to a group, I always talk to people one at a time. And that makes it easier too, because you know how to talk to a person. It's like, can you talk to a thousand people? Well, probably not, because it's too intimidating. But there isn't a thousand people there. There's a thousand individuals. And so you just look at an individual and you say something and you can tell if they're engaged, they look confused or they look interested or they look angry or they look bored or maybe they're asleep, in which case you look at someone else. <laughs> And they, they give you feedback about how you're doing. And so one thing is to, to have something to say, yeah, but the next thing is pay attention to who you're talking to. Because unless you're very badly socialized, and that seems unlikely in your case, because you, know, you present yourself at least moderately well, you know, and well, I mean, I don't know you very well, but on first, but on first sight, you know, you're, you're doing fine. So the probability that if you pay attention to the individuals that you're talking to, that your natural 
wealth of, of social skill will manifest itself is extremely high. And so you don't deliver a talk to an audience. That's a really bad way of thinking about it. You're actually engaged in a conversation with an audience. Even if they're not s talking, they're nodding and shifting position and you know, looking like this or, and you can, you can pull all that in and, and, and use it to govern the level at which you're addressing the entire audience. So the last thing I would say is, well, having the aim to be a good communicator is a good start. And you think, well, I could buttress that to some degree. Well, there isn't anything that you can possibly, this is the whole point of a liberal education. There isn't anything that you can possibly do that makes you more competent in everything you do than to learn how to communicate. I don't care if you're gonna be a carpenter. I mean, being a carpenter, by the way, is very difficult, especially if you're a good carpenter, but if you're good at communicating as a carpenter, you're like 10 times better as a carpenter. So, the, and this is something that the liberal arts colleges, I think, have, I don't know if they've forgotten it, but they don't do a very good job of marketing. It's like, well, what's the use of a bachelor's degree, a bachelor of arts? It's like, well, you can think, you can write, you can speak, you've read something. It's like, the economic value of that is incalculable. The people that I've watched in my life who've been spectacularly successful are, they have skills, clearly. That, that's a minimum precondition. But they're also very, very good at articulating themselves. And so whenever they negotiate, they're successful. Well, that's kind of like the definition of success in life, right? You negotiate and you're successful. It doesn't mean you win. Because if you're a good negotiator, if you're a really good negotiator, everybody walks away from the negotiation thrilled. And so then people line up to do things with you. So, and that's all, in, that's all dependent on your ability to communicate. So, practice. Oh yes, chapter nine is assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. This is a chapter about conversation and about the different forms conversation takes. And it's a chapter about humility. And it's a chapter about listening. And the humility element is, it took me a long time to understand why there's religious injunctions supporting humility. But to even understand what the word really meant in that sort of technical sense. And it means something like this. It means what you don't know is more important than what you know. And, and that's a lovely thing to, then, then what you don't know can start to be your friend, you see. People are very defensive about what they know, and for the reasons we've already discussed. But the thing is, you don't know enough. And the re you can tell you don't know enough because your life is not what it could be, and neither is the life of the people around you. You just don't know enough. And so, what that means is that every time you encounter some evidence that you're ignorant, someone points it out, you should be happy about that because you think, oh, you just told me how I'm wrong. It's like, great, like maybe I had to sift through a lot of nonsense to get through the real message that you're telling me, but if you could actually tell me some way that I'm wrong, and then maybe give me a hint about how to not be wrong like that, well then I wouldn't have to be wrong like that anymore. That, that would be a good thing, and, and you, can, you, can, you can embark on that adventure by listening to people. And if you listen to people, they will tell you They'll tell you amazing things if you listen to them, and many of those things are little tools that you can put in your toolkit, like Batman, and then you can go out into the world and use those tools, and you don't have to fall blindly into a pit quite as often. And so the humility element is, well, do you want to be right, or do you want to be learning? And, and, and it's deeper than that. It's do you want to be the, the tyrannical king who's already got everything figured out, or do you want to be the continually transforming hero, or fool for that matter, who's getting better all the time? And that's actually a choice, you know. Um, it's a deep choice, and it's better to be the self-transforming fool who's humble enough to make friends with what he or she doesn't know, and to listen when people talk. And listening is a transformative exercise. Like if, if you listen to the people in your life, for example, if you actually listen to them, they'll tell you what's wrong with them and how to fix it and what they want. They can't even help it if you start listening because people are so shocked if you actually listen to them that they, they tell you all those sorts of things that they might not have even intended to, things they don't even know. And then you can, you can work with that. But our topic, is the rising tide of compelled speech in Canada. It's a fucking lie! But they... No such thing as compelled speech! The no. government cannot tell you what to do!
That's pure narcissism at work, by the way. You know, to hijack, a, to hijack an event like this that other people put time and effort into and to use the, their, their civility of the crowd and the civility of the organizers as an excuse to blatantly yell out your ill-informed opinions is no way to conduct a civil dialogue. It's, these people are not your friends. <laughs> You see, you know, that's, that, that, and, and mark my words, that's the sounds of the barbarians pounding at the gates. Right. Yeah, that's, I'll, I'll tell you again, too, that use of inchoate, what would you call it? Inchoate sensation is the best formulation of their argument. And there's not much difference between knocking on the doors and knocking on you. So keep that in mind. It's not amusing. There's nothing to it. There's nothing for it. The thing that's also quite appalling is that there's no evidence whatsoever that the people who are conducting these protests know what it is that they're protesting against. You know, I was in... I, I was in the midst of a discussion attempting to make the case that it's freedom of speech that's, that is what people who have nothing still have, right? So if you look at the tyrannical structure of our society, let's say the people at the top have access to means of communication. Everyone knows that. It's the people at the bottom who have the right to say what they think, however badly they say it, that enables them to get a toehold into the system and to and to make their suffering known. That's what freedom of speech is for. And so like, what's the protest against that? And I'll tell you, you know, that the radical neo-Marxist types, they speak the language of power, and that's what they're speaking right now. And if you want to live in a world where everyone speaks the language of power, then just let them do what they're doing and see what happens. I wouldn't recommend it. It's not a pretty road. And you're all in a position, you're all in a situation in your life now where you have to make decisions about these sorts of things. Like, is this the sort of institution that you want this to be? I do believe it's the case because I've watched people do very difficult things, like people who work in palliative care wards. So all they're ever dealing with is pain and death, right? And they can do it. They get up in the morning, they go to work, and they take care of those people. They lose people on a weekly basis, and yet they can do it. And what that shows is that if you turn around and you confront the suffering voluntarily, you find out that you are way tougher than you think. It's not that life is better than you think. Life is as harsh as you think. It might even be worse, but you are way tougher than you think if you turn around and confront it. And so then what you discover is that there's a spirit within you that, pursues, that can pursue something meaningful, that has the resilience and the strength to contend properly with the catastrophe of existence without becoming bitter. That's actually the central, so, mm. and then I would say that's one of the central themes of the 12 Rules for Life, is that make no mistake about it, like, the first noble truth of Buddhism, life is suffering. This is true, and it's worse than that, because it's suffering contaminated by malevolence. That's the baseline. But, and so that's very pessimistic, but the optimistic part is that you are so tough, you can actually not only deal with that, you can improve it. Mm. It's like, hmm, oh, well that's a horrible situation, but it turns out that I'm armed for the task. Well, that's, that's a great thing for people to know. And I do believe, I think the fact that we're armed for the task is even more true than the fact that life is catastrophe contaminated by malevolence. We're stronger than things are terrible. So, and things are pretty terrible. So that means we're pretty damn strong. <laughs> wow. Yes, it's a very good thing to know. And it's not naive optimism. Yeah. It's a very different thing. It's like, no, things are terrible. They're brutal. And you are so tough, you can't believe it. You love to quote this line, this Nietzsche line, that anyone who has a why to live for can endure almost any how. Yeah. What's your why? What is driving you? You see, when people read history, they, they either read it as a detached observer or they tend to read it as, well, maybe the heroic 
the heroic protagonist people like to imagine that they would be Schindler in Schindler's List, but that's wrong. So because the probability that you'll be the perpetrator is much higher, especially merely the perpetrator who's ensconced in silence when silence is not the appropriate thing. So I wanted to, having figured out what constituted hell and the pathway to that, which would be, I suppose, the cowardice that produces, the cowardice and resentment that produces either complicitness in those events or failure to oppose them when they emerge, I wanted to understand what the opposite of that was. Because I think that's what needs to be learned from what happened in the 20th century, and so that's why I wrote Maps of Meaning, was to understand that and to lay out what the opposite was. And then that turned out to be extremely helpful to me and then to the people I started to teach about that, because it's useful to know what the opposite of hell is. And I've been teaching those things to people since 1993, so that's 25 years. And the response from the students has always been the same sort of response that I'm getting now, um, absent some of the negative uh, characterizations, let's say, which, which have emerged for, say. For, for, for particular reasons. But the students have always said one of two things, and, and this is the vast majority of them. This isn't cherry-picked responses. It's been the same everywhere. Um, they tell me, and th this is the same response I get from my audiences now, too, is they say, you've given me words to explain things, to explain and understand things that I always knew to be true, or I was in a very dark place for one of the seven reasons that people might be in a dark place, alcohol or drugs or failure of relationships or lack of vision or nihilism or, or hopelessness or depression or anxiety, or, you know, all the pitfalls that people can encounter. And I've been developing a vision for my life and trying to adopt responsibility and trying to be careful with what I say and things are way better. And that's what drives me. What's your definition of greatness? Well, greatness is what reveals itself when you, when you attempt to formulate, when you attempt to carefully articulate and live out what you believe to be true. It just happens because there isn't anything more powerful than truth, right? That's the antidote to suffering, truth, right? So it's a strange thing because you think, well, yeah, it produces a lot of suffering too. It's like, <laughs> yeah, in the short term. They say, do you believe in God, let's say? And my response to that always is, well, I don't know what you mean when you ask me that question, so I don't know how to answer it. I don't know what you mean by believe, but I can tell you something that I believe. And I would say this is a, a way of speaking symbolically. I do believe, so I was thinking the other day, a week ago, I was thinking about this, I this little fantasy that entered my mind. I was thinking about St. Joseph's Oratorio in Montreal. And St. Joseph's Oratorio is a very large religious building. It's one of the biggest cathedral-like structures in the world. And it's set on the hill on Mount, Mount Royal, and it's set up where it can catch the sun. You know, so it's an image of the heavenly city on the hill, right? It's an image of the structures that we strive to create. That's what it is, in, independent of its specifically Christian or religious function. That's what it stands for symbolically. Okay, so it's the city on the hill. It's, it's what we're striving towards when we walk uphill in life. Okay, now, the way the, the, the oratorio is structured, there's hundreds of steps leading to it up the front. And in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of people who had physical disabilities came there, and they struggled up the step on their crutches, and many of them left their crutches in the oratorio. You can see hundreds of them if you go there. It's quite an interesting sight. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about what that meant, and this is what it means. It means that, you know, everyone has their disabilities, let's say, and I know that some people are far more terribly affected than other people. I'm perfectly aware of that. But the question is, what do you do about that? And what you do is you, you set yourself up on your crutches and you struggle up the bloody hill. That's what you do. And you struggle up the hill towards the kingdom of God. That's what you do. Because the alternative is to descend into the abyss. That's the alternative. And then so to say, well, do you believe? It's like, I believe that you should struggle uphill towards the city of God on your crutches. That's what you should do. That's the opposite of the descent into the abyss. And so that's, that's at the foundation of our civilization, that idea. Well, argue with it if you will. 
See if you can figure out why that's not an acceptable idea. Maybe you should help someone struggle up the hill. Perhaps you should. You know, you can lend a hand to someone, although you don't want to take the burden away from them entirely because there's something noble about struggling up the hill, right? There's something, that's adventure. That's the call to proper being. It's like, well, we don't need to forget this. You know, we don't need to forget it. The universities have been there since time immemorial to try to push that idea forward through the generations. And everyone needs to know that idea. That's what gives your life not happiness. Forget about that. If it comes, well, great, accept it. I made a decision when the computers started to become omnipresent, and so that would have been about 1993, that I was gonna spend a year, and that was the first year that I was teaching in Boston, pretty much doing nothing but figuring out how Intel 486s worked. And it meant there was a lot of other things that I had to put on hold, but I did become a competent computer user, and I was, I'm pretty fast. But, you know, my son, it's just annoying as hell to watch him on the computer and on the phone because, and my graduate students as well, because they're so much faster than me that it's not even funny, and I'm not really accustomed to being slower than someone else in the room. You know, if I had children now, the one thing I would bloody well make sure that they knew was how to use a computer, how to program, man. Because if you're smart and you can use a computer, you are so much smarter than you are if you're just smart that it's not even funny. Mm. You know, and you talk to people, you Very see this in Silicon Valley all the time, you talk to people who are expert computer users, they are so bloody powerful, it is just beyond belief. So, and that, that's gonna do nothing but expand, right? Because Moore's law is not dead and computers are doubling in power every 18 months. And, and so, and who the hell knows where that's going to go. I don't know what percentage of human effort is spent in counterproductive activity. You know, I, I'm, I'm not an absolute cynic about that, but I mean, when I talk to undergraduates, I ask them, you know, how much time do you waste every day by your own reckoning? And, it's somewhere between five and eight hours. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of time. Well, I usually walk through, I walk the stu students through an economic analysis of that. I said, well, you know, why don't you value your time at $50 an hour and calculate for yourself just exactly what you're doing to your future by your inability to discipline yourself. It's worth thinking through. In any case, people do waste a lot of time and they, are, they also act counterproductively a lot of the time. The other thing you should do if you're not very industrious, industrious is discipline yourself. And so what do you do with that? Eat three times a day at regular meal times. That's a good thing to practice because that starts to put some stability into your life. Get up at the same time. I would highly recommend all those young people out there who are listening, like you want to get a jump on life, get the hell out of bed in the morning. You know, as I've got older, I've got up earlier and earlier. Now that's partly because you don't need as much sleep, but it's also partly because I've got more and more disciplined. Like, get up early in the morning and get your things done. Man, learn to get up at six in the morning and you'll be one deadly creature, especially if you can get to work. You'll have half your day done by the time other people haul their sorry asses out of bed. And so that's a massive, massive advantage. Look, Will Farrell, um, Warren Farrell, not the comedian, Warren Farrell, the author, he outlined data in Why Men Earn More, which is a book I would recommend, by the way, showing that if you work 13% longer hours, you make 40% more money. It's nonlinear. So you think, why is that? Well, imagine you had 10 employees and one of them works an extra 10%. It's not much. Well, how often is that person going to be promoted, assuming you have a clue as a boss? It's like you're going to look at the 10 people and you're going to think, oh, that guy's always here like 45 minutes early. It's like, why don't we give him the promotion? Obviously, right? So these, tie, these small edges that you can manage like that, work an extra 10% or extra 13%, have non-proportional payoffs. That's part of the Pareto distribution. So get, get your sleep cycle organized so you get up in the morning. Learn how to do it. No excuses. I'm too tired in the morning. I don't like mornings. Who cares? That's not relevant. It's like discipline yourself so you can manage it. Schedule your meals because that's a good disciplinary routine. And then learn to use a calendar, like Google Calendar. Most of you, many of you out there do not use a calendar. Okay, a calendar is not a prison and it's not a tyrant. Not if you use it properly. A calendar keeps anxiety at bay. It makes sure that you do what you need to do, which is important because otherwise you fall behind. But if you use it properly, it's also 
helps you plan what you want to do. So I could say, well, lay out your calendar and design the days you would like to have. That's what your calendar is, is for. So you can put in all sorts of things in there you want to do and that would be good for you. And that's a really good, a really good way to start being more industrious. Make a plan. You need a plan for three years. You need a plan for the next year. You need a plan for the next six months. You need a plan for the next three months. You need a plan for the week. You need a plan for the day. You need a plan for the hour. All of that. All of that. I make lists constantly of what I have to do. And they're like daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Right now, I can't look out more than about six months, you know, because my life is too complicated and chaotic. But, but you need a vision of who you could be, what character you could have. Three to five years out, you can't go much farther than that because life is too unpredictable I think to make vision that's longer term than that subject to there's too, too much chance associated with it to spend a lot of time on maybe you can stretch it to five years and in rare cases you can have a 10 year goal but it has to be pretty low resolution but you want plans at all those levels of resolution you want to write the things down and what because what are you going to do are you going to stumble around and get get what you need you're going to stumble around and be useful to other people? And it's useful to be useful to other people, you know? They want to work with you then. They want to do things with you. They want to have you around. They trust you. They open up opportunities for you. And if you stumble around like you're blind, you're not going to get anywhere. And then you're going to suffer. And then you're going to be bitter. And then you're going to be cruel. So that's, a that's hell. That's a bad outcome. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you're different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration. If you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. If you want another amazing Jordan Peterson video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.